So this is the first meeting of a kind of attempt to run. Well, it, it is more than an attempt to run. We are running a constitutional convention for Yorkshire. And we're starting this meeting today um, as uh, an exploration of the discussion paper that's been published by Democratic Yorkshire. The meeting's going to run till, it said eight, advertises eight, but we're really expecting to finish at, by 7.30 at the latest. Um, my name's Simon Duffy. I'm the president of the Citizen Network Cooperative, uh, and we are a platform for lots of projects which are really about driving forward citizenship around the world. Our mission is to create a world where everyone matters. But we started here in Sheffield, and Yorkshire is very important to us, and supporting Democratic Yorkshire is one of the um, important initiatives that we try and um, support. This event is also part of Festival of Debate. Festival of Debate is the biggest independent festival of politics in the UK. Again, started here in Sheffield by Opus Independents, who are also members of Citizen Network Cooperative. Um, this is a Zoom meeting. It's not a webinar. It's a Zoom meeting. Um, it's being recorded. So we're going to, we will edit the, the all the chat at the beginning. But from now on, it, we will be publishing this um, meeting and the discussion online on YouTube. Um, and so if you don't want your face to be shown, please turn it off and just be conscious of that it is going to be a, a public record of our discussion. Um, we can. Our group isn't so large that we probably need to worry about this, but we, if you want to put comments in the chat, please do. Um, as I say, I've shared some things that are relevant in the chat, and I can reshare these things if you don't see them available. Um, is there anything else I needed to say? No, I think I just wanted to, I mean, in a way, I think this meeting, actually, um, if people don't mind, we could actually all briefly introduce ourselves because we are a very small group. Um, but I was going to ask Ed to introduce himself first. So, and... Ed and Michael are both here from the Independent Constitutionalist UK. So Ed, would you just like to introduce yourself and explain your role in relationship to the work of Democratic Yorkshire? Button twice, uh, there we go. Um, yes, I'm Ed Straw. Uh, I'm part of the Independent Constitutionalist UK with uh, Michael and Carol when she's here. Um, I've spent a long time in and around politics and government, uh, particularly the whole run up to the new Labour thing, the new Labour thing, and then after the new Labour thing. And uh, my conclusion from all of that, uh, trying to get policies put into place that actually worked, um, was that the fundamental issue in relation to government and a uh, government and governance in the UK was the system of governing. Uh, the system of governing uh, as defined by the constitution. And so I got working on uh, how that system might be better. It, it's probably worth saying that my perspective is from an organizational and systems thinking perspective. I'm, I'm not a constitutional academic or a constitutional lawyer. Um, some of those are very good, and very useful. But in terms of designing a system of governing, it needs to come from uh, places of understanding that go beyond uh, the academics and the lawyers. And uh, I bumped into the Independent Constitutionist UK, I can't quite remember when, maybe eight years ago, who were uh, a, a group of people who had independently come together to say, well, we need to do something about the Constitution, and had produced a declaration and a note, which I was very impressed by, and joined in with them. I mean, Michael will introduce himself uh, in a minute. Um, there was Michael, uh, Carol, who will also introduce herself. Um, 
we had or we have uh, Evan Parker, who's uh, a, a professor of quantum mechanics at uh, Warwick University, bringing his perspective to it. Um, uh, Fred Harrison, who is a specialist in Georgish, uh, Georgian economics, which is about uh, uh, approaching economics from the perspective of land and the use of land and the taxation of land. Um, Brian uh, and others who had come together to produce this. What we've been doing is trying to support um, Yorkshire uh, and uh, Yorkshire democracy in its development of a constitution by feeding in the stuff that we've developed. There's a constitutional template, uh, which is as far as we've got now, which sets out, if you like, the bones of what a constitution would look like or could look like, uh, and how to develop it. The big issue, as ever, uh, is that when you mention the C word, uh, this particular, the other C word, people sort of leap up and down and get terribly excited. When you mention this C word, uh, people go to sleep. And how the big issue for me is, you know, how do you make this thing uh alive how do you make it meaningful for people to say yeah we now understand that that's what we need to do Pol politics is addictive uh and i'm sorry to say uh periodically i get drawn back into the addiction and in some respects you might say well why not uh because things are so bloody awful at least we could have something that's slightly less bloody awful or, or you know might even be sort of vaguely good but in the long run, uh, we, it, 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 politics doesn't provide the answer. Um, so that's probably enough, Simon, is it, by way of sort of scene setting in terms of what we at ICUC have been up to? Perfect. Thank you, Ed. Well, and, and Philip, mindful of your sometimes your audio not being very good, just would you like to just say a little bit about... Democratic Yorkshire and just welcome the group and then then yeah. we'll do a very quick round for everybody else so we get into the meat of things quick. Right, great. I'm sorry, I was just trying to um, help Richard to get in. He sends his apologies, he's struggling to uh, get online. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much uh, from Democratic Yorkshire's point of view for uh, joining us. Um, some of you will remember that we did do a, a campaign for a Yorkshire Parliament a few years back. And we made some progress, but it sort of fell apart. So we not, not been much to give up, so we decided to launch Democratic Yorkshire instead, which was um, not this last New Year, but the New Year before. Uh, I see UK have been an absolutely fantastic help in trying to uh, in helping us get things moving. And I've got to say, and and on that, that we wouldn't have been able to get anywhere near where we are without uh, their help, particularly Michael and Ed. Uh, having said that, it, the thing really took off uh, when. Um, Simon joined us and, uh, and his organisation helped get the thing moving forward. Now, my apologies because I'm having trouble with my microphone, so I don't know if people have been able to hear me properly or not. We but, have. We, we um, can, Philip, but, yeah, it is a bit tinny. So, yes, I'll keep, right. keep it tight. Right, I'll leave it, I'll leave it tight. Fortunately, Richard's just joined us as well, so I'm sure he'll have plenty to say. Is that uh, I'm usually the quiet one, as everybody knows. So, um, so all I really want at, from now, so we can get into things, is because it's a small group, is people could just say who they are, just so that to everybody else here. Um, and I'll um, maybe we've already had Ed mention IC UK, but Michael. Um, if I ask you to unmute and then just introduce yourself very briefly, not for just really just say who you are. 
Yeah, okay. Um, I'm the uh, Michael Mulvey. I'm the coordinator of the outreach working group of the ICUK. The only thing I would add to what has, Ed has said, which is perfectly correct, is that the template we've produced doesn't actually really try to convey what a constitution might look like, because that's up to the constitution framers. But it does try to indicate the essential agreements of what a constitution should cover in terms of a reformed political system. And that's an important distinction. We're not constitutional experts, we're not lawyers, but we have enough um, commitment and interest to know what the new system would involve. Um, basically, the template boils down to four basic components. One, much greater citizen involvement. Two, devolution to the English regions through subsidiarity, written constitutions, and money out of politics. And of course, Yorkshire is, as far as we're concerned, the pilot project for regional uh, devolution, autonomy, whatever you want to call it. So uh, Yorkshire, we're working with... We, you know, we're, we're simply uh, cheerleading Yorkshire because if you can do it, then the others will follow you. OK, thanks. Thanks, Michael. And Simon, would you mind just telling people who you are? Um, I need to probably release your... Yes. So am I there now? Yes, lovely. Yes. Um, hi there, I'm uh, Simon Bulcliffe, co-leader uh, of the Yorkshire Party, which is a devolutionist party, uh, trying to establish a uh, Yorkshire Parliament for the five and a half million people that are uh, reside in this wonderful county of ours, um, to give them better life chances, uh, basically, on so many different levels. Uh, and we all know, like in any organisation, any business, if you can delegate power to the people with the vested interest to make the best decisions you get better quality decisions and you get much greater uh, economic and uh, social outcomes as well as obviously environmental ones as well um, by actually having power vested to the people that it makes the most difference to and i think uh, you can feel in in westminster there's a movement there but a very weak one it's kind of lip service rather than, you know, words rather than deeds. So, uh, and we stand for a, a very strongly developed parliament, rather like uh, uh, Scotland has got, and uh, hopefully we, we can work towards that. Thank you, Simon. That's perfect. Um, John, would you mind, and, and, you, and you don't have to turn your camera on if, if um, but would you mind just introducing yourself to the rest of the group? Hello? Hello, John. We can hear you. We can hear you, John. Or well, we did briefly. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's a technical problem. I'll let I'll, I'll I'll let you off that task because I think that's it's some there's probably a microphone problem. Um. And then, oh no! Did, were you coming back there, John? Give it one more go. No. Okay. Richard. He's on mute now. He wasn't yeah. on mute. So I don't know. If... I'll try one more time. John, are you there? Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Loud, as they say in the Eurovision Song Contest. Can you we hear can. me? We can. Loud and yeah. clear. Yeah. So uh, my apologies. I'm out uh, in uh, walking on the streets in Leeds, uh, going to another meeting that I have to address, so my apologies. Uh, but I just say, John Grogan, I'm from One Yorkshire, and I follow as much of the discussion as I can, which is interesting already. And I just offer one thought uh, following on the, the last contribution. I think we're probably, we're more Wales in 1995, 96, 97 than Scotland, if we're honest. You know, that it isn't the settled will of the Yorkshire people uh, that they want a particular devolution settlement. Uh, and we kid ourselves if we think it is. But there is, I think, uh, uh, a lot of concern about the centralisation of power. There's a lot of identity uh, around Yorkshire. There's a feeling uh, that there's a lot of injustice out there. And so, you know, just as in Wales, it, it was a, a debate that uh, went on for 20 years and still going on, really. But uh, and the referendum result was very close. 
I think that we're in a similar position in Yorkshire uh, and there's everything to play for. And uh, 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 one thing that we keep stressing in one Yorkshire is the need to advocate for the need for some devolution, at least across the Yorkshire uh, county as a whole, and not just settle for uh, uh, devolution in the various parts of Yorkshire. Thank you, John. That's very helpful. And Richard, I'm going to ask you to you just say who you are. And... Yeah, I'm Richard Onanasi. I think most people here know who I am anyway. I'm I'm the silent partner in Democratic Yorkshire. That's a nice way of putting it. Let's <laughs> fill it there. No laughing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Thanks. that that more or less sums me up. I think <laughs> the eminent <laughs> grise. <laughs> Yes, well, we're a lot more to you than that, Richard. But we'll, we'll 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 let's crack on to the business of the the meeting, which is to review the discussion paper that's been published by Democratic Yorkshire. So I'm going to quickly um, share that on the screen, and um, the so th you should be able to see here the paper. It has um, some very kind of clearly set out areas that I think are, are worth looking at. So I'm just going to I'm going to assume that people have seen it or are going to get some sense from it from a quick run through, and then we're going to just discuss it and see what people want to say. But I th I thought the the structure of it is interesting. It starts with an introduction, and the key word in that introduction is harmony, which I think is a, a great place to start. And then we talk about Yorkshire's values. And those values, there are seven values that are set out. Altruism, cooperation, ecological civilization, inclusion, respect, the rule of law, and subsidiarity. And then we have um, aims for the constitution. So again, the, we've touched on some of these things and, and the, I think they're interesting and straightforward to talk about so the first of these aims to secure for the Yorkshire region sovereign control of its own affairs within a federal UK so democratic Yorkshire is not declaring independence for Yorkshire but it is talking about a significant shift in power within that structure um, an elected regional parliament for Yorkshire so again consistent with the demands of one Yorkshire not a piecemeal approach to a democratic change in Yorkshire a third is a shift towards deliberative democracy, so not just representative democracy. The fourth is a shift to shifting power further down to local neighbourhoods. And the paper refers to the work that we're involved in, actually called the Neighbourhood Democracy Movement, which talks about real power in neighbourhoods further down than local government itself, in fact, and opening up the opportunity for much more participative democracy. Um, and the fifth is to use the intelligence collected from the neighbourhoods to inform decision-making processes of any higher authorities. So um, grassroots democracy might perhaps be one way of thinking about that. Um, and the sixth is an initiative to ensure that everyone is enabled to be um, a member, a citizen of this community. So it's an inclusive vision of Yorkshire and uh, the authors of the paper have kindly referred to some of my work, which talks about what citizenship involves. But I won't, I'll skip over that. <laughs> and the seventh very important aim is to ensure our environment and ecological sustainability for future generations. And the, the kind of last section is then to explore, and I guess this, is, this touches on what is the scope of Yorkshire democracy and this sets out 18 areas of responsibility. So agriculture, fisheries, food, arts and culture, economic development, education and training, energy, environment and heritage, employment, fiscal policy, again, very important, health and social care, home affairs, lots of things that are very centralised at the moment, housing, planning, social services, sport, tourism, trade, industry, transport, and well-being, 
which is also very actually interestingly uh john mentioned this i think that this is a really important theme currently in welsh devolution actually making it a centerpiece of their policy so uh, i'm going to stop sharing now having run through that and um I remind people if they've not seen it of this i'll reshare it so if you want to just write comments about this as opposed to just talking about it. it won't be very easy for john as he walks through the streets of leeds i'm aware but um really we're just interested in a discussion about some of these things what the what's people's emotional reaction people's intellectual perspective on this what do people agree with what do people strongly think is either missing or maybe misframed anybody want to dare to put their hand up um you can do it Visually with your hand, or you can do it with, um, I think there is the space bar will allow you to set up a reaction or there's a little thing at the bottom. Anybody want to offer some thoughts in, in response to this paper? Oh, and Carol's just joined us as well. Um, but, and so is Tobias Foster. <laughs> so we've got two late entries. We will welcome and then just see where we want to go next. So welcome, Carol. Welcome, Tobias. You've missed the introductory section. I'm sorry about that. And you've missed a run through of the paper that is on the Democratic Yorkshire website. I'm going to just put these things in the um, chat again. But while I do that, would anybody like to just offer some initial thoughts? And if nobody does, I'm going to pick on Ed. <laughs> can I raise a point there, Simon? You can. Yeah, there, there's an interesting point that um, people maybe have not really noticed. Uh, there's a an issue in terms of sovereign control, um, which might be a slight conflict, because basically that means, in my view, that Yorkshire would have control of all its internal affairs. So in terms of responsibilities, we've got those that are listed, but we've also got everything else by default, um, which is no bad thing. I mean, for me, I think it's great, but others might see that as a conflicting issue. Um, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things. I rather like it myself, but... Um... <laughs> By that, do you mean that in a sense that sovereign, a, a kind of sovereign version of a federal system is assumes the default power lies with Yorkshire? Yes. In, in, for for in internal then... affairs, the default power lies with Yorkshire. And I suppose in, in a sense, the, 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 the idea at the bottom up is, is there because it's the people's constitution. Um, the people decide what they want and the people decide... Uh, what powers to surrender, if you like. Um, I don't know whether that was deliberate. I, I've discussed it with Philip, and it, it's one of those things that it was there, and, and it, it, it's quite intriguing. Um, but it does sort of throw an interesting spanner in the works, if you like. Um, and I, I just find it a, a different way of looking at it altogether, because um, basically... We say what what is ours, which is all internal things, and I don't think we've really gone in any depth as to what is internal. Um, but basically, then you say, well, we can't do this. We can't do. You might want to say we can't do foreign affairs. That would be ridiculous. So that's a power that will sit with the UK. Um, defense. Well, we don't really want to do that. That is a power that will sit with the UK. But it's sort of the other way around, whereas at the moment the UK says, oh, we might give you transport. We might give you some aspects of social services. Um, this is sort of the other way around, which is probably the right way around, but it's just a different way of doing things. It's, it's very, it's novel, if you like. It's a good negotiation position at the very least, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't start by begging for a bit more power, but assume you have it. Assume you are <laughs> in sense sovereign. But yeah, we we are on a journey. What about I'm gonna I, unless somebody offers, I am gonna pick on Ed to then just follow that maybe. 
Um, I think, uh, so just let me get the paper. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a, a great uh, piece of work. Um, and I guess uh, it inevitably, uh, the 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 thing it it seems to me if you if you go through the values um you know it, it it's i'd be interested to find uh someone who you know disagreed with them in a way um and and that which is not to damn them with faint praise at all but, but to consider well you know, it, 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 this does sound like a good set of values by which we live together. Um, so I haven't really much to uh, say about that. I mean, you could, I suppose, the first one, altruism, I'm a part of Compassionate Communities UK, and, and you could express that. In, in in a slightly different way and you could say well compassion uh compassionate concern for the well-being of others uh altruism can be a tricky word um but otherwise yeah away you go um the 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 aims um are uh again you know it, it's it, it wouldn't it be wonderful if this was all happening? Um, some people will uh, disagree in the sense of saying, and I've heard this, well, you know, some people don't want to participate. They don't want to be involved. They don't want to um, uh, do all, if you like, that's in number four. Um, I think experience shows that uh, they may say that to start off with, and indeed people may say that forever. But actually, once people get involved, they really rather enjoy it. Um, and uh, they understand and, and, and appreciate that they're getting dis better decisions, they're getting better actions, they're getting better outcomes uh, in relation to wherever it is their neighbourhood lies. Um, the next one, the seven keys. Um, um, Simon has obviously done a lot, well, has, has done a lot of work on this. And um, I, I suppose it would be quite interesting then to link those keys through to the powers and through to the architecture of the system that would come uh, as part of the um, Yorkshire Parliament and to see how those would feed through. The the environment, uh, I, I these days I always put the environment first um, uh, since, you know, no, no, no habitat, no environment, no people. Um, and it does seem to me to be getting pretty important that we all get that lodged in our heads um, rather than it being a, a, a sort of, and, and I know you, you don't mean this, Philip, but but coming in at number seven, it's, it's sort of like a bit of an add-on. Um, and, um, yeah, one, once we get in, into our heads that we're, you know, currently uh, following the path of Darwin um, and uh, we're in an evolutionary experiment and uh, quite how we do or don't pop out the end of that experiment um, is uh, where we are and rather fundamental. The areas of responsibility and, and Richard's point, you know, that, well, let, let's start with the lot. Um, I, I think he's absolutely right. The you, you can then bump into certain issues, and I'd be really interested to see how these compare with uh, the... Uh, Lando, the regions in Germany and the cantons in Switzerland, which is much smaller, of course. But you take something like food standards. Um, you know, do do we 
I mean, we do have control of food standards in Wales, and the great benefit of, of difference uh, in different parts of the UK is that you then, in effect, get experimentation and you find that, well, actually, this seems to work better here than it does there. And so why don't we do that? Whereas if you just have the Whitehall Westminster model, then you're stuck with it uh, and you never have much of a chance to find it something better. But things like food standards and food security, I think, would be uh, worth considering to, to what extent we really want those split between uh, 10 would, does that work best split between 10 regions? And as I say, I think the uh, um, experience of Germany particularly would be interesting there. Arts and culture, it just seems to me that's a no-brainer. Um, economic development, that's a no-brainer and plays particularly to the point that uh, Simon was making earlier on. Uh, education and training, <laughs> just as an aside, um, and we do we do have a different curriculum in Wales, uh, and I'm I'm pleased to say some people have been thinking about it, and it and you know the proof is in the pudding, and we don't yet have the pudding, or I think the pudding has just started, but my goodness, it doesn't half look uh, a much better curriculum than the one uh, we have in uh, England, and in England, one person decides what every school child is going to learn. One person. Uh, it was Michael Gove. Uh, it's probably someone else now. And it's like, are we mad? Yeah. How, how about, why don't you do it, Michael, or Richard, or, you know, it's on. Uh, uh, it, this is nutty. It's even nuttier when you think about what what do we need as a knowledge base to deal with the world as it is? This enormously complex uh, no, uh, complex world with all sorts of things going on. Well, well, actually, we don't need a curriculum that's like this. We need a curriculum that's like this. And therefore, I think the argument for every school to be teaching something different, other than the absolute basics, uh, it is is manifest. Surely, we 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 have a situation where we are constrained um, uh, in the Whitehall Westminster model, but in any model, we are constrained by the education of the people there. And that education, you know, as often because of the school system, it goes there, then the university system, and then the part time they've done, you know, typically Oxford University and a PPE. That's about all they know. Um, who, who was I on? Uh, oh, I was listening to George Monbiot the, uh, last night. Um, he was talking about his latest book. He was talking about um, uh, the food and the agricultural system. And his argument is that it's systemically now in a situation, the same situation that the financial system was in before the crash. Um, you, you know, very limited. Here we are. Michael's showing showing us the book. Well done. And the the the, the point he was making is that if you just take the media, uh, well, the, the whole of the London establishment, the think tanks, the civil service, the uh, politicians, typically there'll be humanities graduates. At this point. I have to say, you know, some of my best friends, my my relatives and all the rest of humanities graduates, terrific, brilliant. However, having one largely one tradition of understanding, and he's saying, you know, part of the reason that this food and agricultural problem is not coming to the surface is precisely because of the narrow base of education of the decision makers. They just don't get the science. Sorry, that's a long way around saying education and training. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, no national, no, no Yorkshire curriculum, um, as much diversity as possible. And, and of course, yeah, there, and let's have some things in there which will be useful life skills um, like, you know, relationships and so on and so forth. Um, energy policy. 
Yep. Uh, I mean, that's a, a really interesting one, isn't it? And to what extent you can grip that at, at the regional level and, and make Yorkshire, um, uh, in effect, a leader in getting us to where we need to be. Um, yep, employment. I mean, employment, there's another one, employers' rights and employers' responsibilities. And the way in which um, we've seen uh, the, the rise, the, 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 the re-emergence of, of uh, frankly, crap management, um, which was prevalent when I first got into the world of management in the uh, mid 70s and onwards and was pretty pathetic it it then developed very considerably um not least with uh the international pressures uh and competitive pressures and also that the actually in those days some very good management education but now um i think several things have happened one is that yeah that the whole diminution of employers rights um, the uh, way in which it's sort of like the Conservative Party would really like us to get back to um, serfdom, uh, the landed gentry, um, uh, you know, shut up and do what you're told, otherwise you're sacked. Uh, and you may say that's a caricature. Well, it's not a caricature. It's a, it's a fact for quite a lot of people. Um, by the way, if you think you're going to protest, we're not having any of that because we've just forbidden that as well uh, because we're not having anyone talking back to us. Um, it's also, uh, 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 and this is trickier, but it's also been the case that employers um, are able uh, pre-Brexit um, to just go and pick up um, highly motivated, well-educated, cheap people from around the, uh, Europe, and that's had a big impact. Um, the fiscal policy, clearly there's a balance here, um, and that uh, absolutely you've got to be able to raise your own money um, and have the right to raise your own money, um, but equally there'll be some uh, national taxation as well. That that's an area, incidentally, where I mean, it's probably leaping ahead. But uh, Fred Harrison's work in saying, you know, I mean, why the hell do we tax people for going to work? Why do we penalise people for going to work? Why do we penalise employers for employing people? I mean, it's called income tax and national insurance. Uh, that doesn't sound very sensible. And he has shown, and others have shown, the way in which you can transfer taxation not necessarily all of it, but transfer taxation to uh, uh, land location value. Health and social care, absolutely. Um, the, the, the number of, as my friend, who's a former uh, consultant in palliative care, um, it, it, you know, we get another top-down disaster coming from Whitehall. <laughs> and I'm afraid, you know, the health system has been under reform since perpetual reform since the early 80s and it's still being reformed or already destroyed um home affairs yeah uh yeah all of that how absolutely housing uh planning social services that, those you know these services so need to be local how how on earth can you prescribe something like uh, social services and housing from the center when, when the, you know, each of those services is so personal, um, you know, the person down the road from me who who is in need of some, some support um, is going to be completely different from the person down the road from you. Sport, tourism, trade and industry, transport. I mean, there's clearly an interface there uh, with the, you know, the, the M1, <laughs> for example, or, or the... Um, the East Coast mainline route and so on. Um, and, and there'll be other interfaces there. But but again, a lot of um, that uh, can be devolved and should be devolved. So, yeah, so it's, I mean, just I've just run through that in my own head in a way. And, it, and it's interesting to ponder 
um, and interesting perhaps to refine. Uh, is uh, Have I done enough, Simon? Am I let off now? <laughs> I thought you did very, very well there. Yes, you've, you've yeah. unpacked several things, Ed. Well done to you. And uh, so you're still... Uh, you don't want me waffling away at you, so I'm really looking for some contributions. I mean, I just add that thing about education. I remember going uh, back in 1994 to the USA as a Harkness Fellow, and one of the people I went with was going from the civil service, and their job was to start designing the national curriculum. And it, it outraged me at the time, the whole thought of it. And my mother as a teacher just... Yeah. She says, you know, nobody in teaching is enjoying their job because they're basically, you know, all their freedom and creativity is being killed. Yeah. We published a paper the other day on the topic of the NHS reforms, exactly making the same point. Morale in the NHS is a yeah. like, for similar yeah. reasons. Yeah. Hideous. 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 These, uh, uh, someone used a frame, uh, a, a, a phrase which I thought was rather good about on the education side, but, you know, we now have these education emperors. You know, and they and they come in and they decide that you know this is how it's going to work. Um, uh, but it but it, it it's sort of more than, and which is not in any way morale of teachers is absolutely crucial. I mean, how do you get a good education system? Well, you stick a decent teacher in the right circumstances with a group of kids. This is not difficult, you know. It's, um, but so their morale is incredibly important. But it goes way beyond that. I mean, it, it, it you know it screws the economy. It screws the way society functions. It screws our understanding of the world and what we need to do to uh, survive. I think that I mean I obviously I I'm, I've got an interest in the in thinking about neighbourhoods in this context, and so mm. I welcome the. The openness, I and mean, I think this is one of the very interesting things about this, the the process that Democratic Yorkshire has begun by offering, I think, a just like a, a more imaginative, open-minded mm. vision mm. for what a reformed constitution for Yorkshire can be. And although it's easy to say, well, that's not realistic, or we're a long way from that, all of which is in one sense true, what is also what you said, Ed, about the environment, I think, it is actually a factor that is going to lead to um, mm. a series of catastrophes mm. which will create um, all, my, all sorts of pressure, mm. uh, but also kind of strange opportunities for radical change. And much of that change will have to activate citizenship at mm. a neighbourhood level and mm. will have to respond to environmental issues at a neighbourhood level. I was last week at the festival debate. I was facilitating an event where Chris Cook was talking about neighborhood energy systems. When you start to think about energy, not just the solar and wind and water, but also the recycling of energy and all sorts of sophisticated stuff going on, the scale of that response is actually at a neighborhood scale. Mm. And, uh, he is describing actually a lot of it is about energy capture and reproduction and shift into local businesses and housing. So it's best done at that scale. Yep. It's actually, its point of efficiency is much closer to the ground than people realise. Mm -hmm. um, that's also about changing the power balance. So people mm -hmm. will start to realise that what they assume at the moment is just some mysterious force, which is actually just capitalism mm -hmm. taking public services and eating our, our, eating away at them. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're going to suddenly discover some of more, some of the power, not just in the democratic sense, but in the very literal sense, the the physics sense, mm. is in our hands. I think. Yeah, yeah, and and then, I mean that point about you know people say, oh, don't you know, don't be ridiculous. We can never have a new constitution and so on. Well, um, we can have a new constitution when sufficient people, do, uh, a new system of governing, when sufficient people say we're going to have a new constitution, and it gets on on the, on the political agenda and um, or the party political agenda, and the questions on the doorstep are, what are you doing about the constitution? What are you doing about the system of governing? The um, other point you were saying there. Simon, about uh, you know the impending um, sort of catastrophe chain that's uh, 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 going to arise because of the impact on the environment. 
there was a book out some time ago which said, well, in practice, you only get a big change in system of governing. Uh, what What is it? War, um, famine, revolution, and plague. So, you know, historically, if you look at those, uh, those, those, those trigger big changes. And I mean, you think about the war, uh, uh, the last one we experienced, the Second World War, um, quite interesting. And in, I've perhaps said this before in, the, in this environment, I don't know, but, you know, who won the Second World War? Well, we did, didn't we? But actually, if you look historically, Germany and Japan did. You, know, you look at what's happened since then. And then you go, oh, that's terribly interesting. And uh, so how did they achieve such a massive turnaround? Uh, well, two things. One was all of their institutions were wiped out. And they, they weren't only wiped out in the sense of, you, you know, they no longer existed in, in a conceptual sense. They, they were physically wiped out as well. Um, and, and, you know, that is often what you need to do to existing institutions which are so embedded in the way in which they work. Um, was a good example there, the Greater London Council, of which I worked for six months in uh, 1974, I think it was. Uh, and uh, it, it was it was just completely gunned up. This was in the days of read this and read that and read the other. Red Ken actually was there. Um, and uh, it, it was completely non-functioning. It, it, it was scrapped by Thatcher. But it was it was a total uh, assault on democracy. But actually, that was the only way of dealing with it. It did need to be scrapped. And there was a twenty-year gap before then the Greater London Authority came about, uh, which was a, a, you know an unnecessary gap and the wrong gap. But the new authority, um, and of course. There's Ken Livingstone again, actually doing a great job. Uh, he, he was really, really effective. Um, so, yeah, the the, the um, uh, er, 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 eradication through those means of of, uh, of existing institutions, but the constitutional the the challenges. Sorry, I'll stop. Simon. the challenges um, that will arise out of the environment may be just the trigger that we need. But make sure you're prepared, that you've got your constitution ready. Thanks, Ed. No, that's great. Uh, so there was a hand from Michael and then a hand from Philip. So, Michael. Yeah, um, just to say that um, on the fiscal uh, point which um, Ed raised, what he meant, uh, Fred Harrison's Georgist economics idea, is that why do you tax earned income before you tax unearned income? That's put it in a nutshell. Uh, I, I think that the this document is an excellent starting point. I think it needs probably quite a lot of improvement to open it out to slightly newer ideas, especially on the um, on the, uh, um, the, sh the, the the powers which we, the functions which would be performed by New York itself. I'm. I'm concerned to think about the overall national situation, and you're going to have to change national mindsets to thinking about to thinking that devolution to the regions is a good idea, and that's going to be a tremendous challenge. And you've also got to put into their heads that basically people sovereignty will be expressed from henceforth at the regional level. That's will, that will be its proper seat, OK? And the regions will come together, as they do in the cantons of Switzerland and the lender in Germany. They come together where they need to come together, which are for, for, for a lot of things. Um, I mean, I, I, there's, there's, there's a lot that could be... Not a lot. I think, it's abs I think the aims, the values are most important. The values are axiomatic. You can't question them. As Ed says... If some, somebody, uh, for example, says such and such a thing, and you say to them, well, do you believe in reciprocity? Do you believe in treating others as you would wish to be treated yourself? And they say, well, yes, of course I do. Then that's why the values are so important. The values are really crucial because they're axiomatic and they're supposed to be, in any case, largely shared by all, except that we have, we're dealing with a 
dumbed down distorted population so i uh, i what i would like to do i haven't looked at this document in any detail um simon uh Philip, but I'd like to compare it to our template, which has exactly the same sort of, um, uh, and I think it could be improved. For example, you have the second uh, section, is it the aims of the Constitution? They're not really the aims of the Constitution. The Constitution is merely a statement of what you're about. They are Yorkshire's aspirations which would then need to be constitutionally entrenched. You must be careful. The constitution is only a way of describing the sort of system of political, structure of political organization you want. You have to decide and agree upon what structure of political organization it is you want. You want greater citizen involvement and you want certain decision-making powers, agency to be given back. And that is then translated into a constitution. So you have, there's a prior a prior it's very important this distinction because a country is only a document okay if you don't decide what you're going to put in the document first of all then you really are at a loss and you're in the hands of uh, very perverse lawyers so that's my so i saw i i'm going to take a look at this and make some suggestions to philip and richard and uh, get on ongoing but there but i think it's basically i really thought that the bylines article by philip which was published at Yorkshire Bylines was absolutely brilliant. That describes the situation you're working, you're faced with, you're working from. And that's, I think that I'm really excellent. I read it through and I enjoyed reading and I thought, my God, they've, they've understood they are suffering a lot. And the actual constitutional, what do you call it? A people's constitution for Yorkshire needs to really be up to that level, and then, and I, I it is the, the the point about this is that the wealth elite and the epistocracy tell us that this is all complicated. It is complicated, but it's not necessarily complicated. We have to operate at a level of simplicity. I'm not an expert in bloody anything. I'm a jack of all trades, a UN interpreter. So I know a bit about everything and nothing really about anything. So we have to strike at a level, and Philip, I think, is very much aware of this, where people can read it and understand it. OK, I've said it enough. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. That's great. Philip, would you like to come in and uh, mindful of your dodgy microphone? <laughs> to try again i'm sure i saw your hand wave right there we go you can now brother, mother right yes um yeah yes, so. i'm really pleased with the way that uh, the conversation is going so far and the contributions we've received um and of course i have i've had the conversations with each of the speakers thus far at different times. But what I'd like to do is I've noticed that Nigel Solit has uh, joined us. Nigel is the um, chairperson, president, which what, one or the other, of YDM, the Yorkshire Democratic Movement, which actually kicked this whole thing off many years ago. Uh, before the Yorkshire Party, in fact, the Yorkshire Party came out of uh, the YDM and, and other things. So I'm really pleased that he's been able to join us. Uh, I would appreciate, first of all, Simon, if you could recap for him a little bit on, on what he's missed earlier and, um, and link him into the uh, document. But also, I'd be really, I'd be really interested in Nigel's wisdom um, from all those years uh, of involvement on, on, on the discussion that we've had. Sorry to put you on the spot, Nigel. Ah, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> uh, right, well, um, yeah, uh, Philip, it's, um, it's actually a Yorkshire devolution movement, not the Yorkshire Democratic movement, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we started, uh, it's actually 10 years ago this year. 
Um, and uh, I see we've got another uh, guest here, uh, Richard Onorati. He was uh, he was our original treasurer, um, going back several years. And um, <clears throat> yeah, basically, what inspired me was a question that um, uh, David Blunkett asked of uh, um, the then Prime Minister. Uh, Cameron, <clears throat> he asked for one good reason why Yorkshire shouldn't have its own devolved parliament. And basically, uh, <laughs> as, as you might expect, we didn't get a, a, a decent answer to that at all. Not a, you know, so that just made me think, well, you know, why shouldn't we have, you know, by that time you would have had uh, London, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, all devolved, all making their own decisions. I couldn't see any reason why uh, Yorkshire, with similar population to Scotland and bigger than Northern Ireland, and um, you know, and uh, a, a bigger population than, than Wales and Northern Ireland put together, um, shouldn't have one as well. So um, yeah, I started getting people together and um, eventually formed the uh, Yorkshire Devolution Movement, and uh, we've been campaigning basically for, for what this is all about since then. Um, and yeah, you're quite right, three, three of our um, members, um, Richard, who I've just mentioned, the other Richard, Richard Carter and Stuart Arnold, um, went off and started the, uh, what was then Yorkshire First, now the Yorkshire Party. So yeah, I'm glad that, uh, <laughs> that, that what we've done has been acknowledged in, to some extent anyway. But the, the important thing is that uh, when we first started, I remember we spoke at some point to um, Andrew Percy, who was then um, you know, in the government responsible for uh, local government and all that kind of thing. And um, he said that there is no appetite for devolution. So, I'm very pleased now that uh, the situation has completely turned on its head and there's devolution deals, well, what they call devolution deals, being uh, handed out, you know, uh, right, left and centre at the moment. Um, they're not ideal. I mean, I, I'm not sure I would call them devolution or delegation myself, um, but um, it's, uh, it, it's something along the right lines. Um, for, for my liking, there's not enough um, listening to what the people want. It's more um, the Treasury saying, you know, this is what you can have. And, and that's where it's going wrong. And I think that's what this should be, uh, you know, th why this is so important, because, um, you know, th this is trying to, the way I see it, this is trying to turn that around so that it's the people that are leading it and not taking what the government is telling us we should have. So um, yeah, I'm pleased that um, I'm pleased with the progress that's uh, that's been made here. Yeah. Thanks so much, Nigel. That was really helpful. Yeah. Um, have we got any other offers for talking, reflecting on the the statements? I'm just checking my little line. We can. It's it's tea time for me, so I I don't mind if we finish a little bit early. Um, uh, the um, the things that I want to draw people's attention to before we end uh, include that Philip will make is making some notes, so we will get in touch with people to tell them about next steps. The film of this talk and the the meeting will be put online. There is a date um, to meet in Huddersfield for a real get together of the Constitutional Convention. Um, so. That's something to put in your diary, 3rd of October. I'm sadly, I had to say to Philip that actually my wife and I have just booked a holiday at that point, so I'm going to be uh, missing from that. Um, I thought I'd just make another couple of observations. Um, Citizen Network is a member of the Democracy Network. There are some changes going on. They're, they're not uh, magical answers to some of the problems we're having, but I think what is happening is the people interested in democracy are starting to get slightly better organised in the UK. So I think that's helpful for some of these things. Um, it's a battle. I'm on the steering group for the 
Democracy Network. It's a battle to get them not just talking about Westminster. So one of the things I'm working hard at is to try and uh, engage funders and the Democracy Network itself in trying to do some more substantial work around the idea of devolution. And so I hope that if I'm successful, I'll be work trying to connect you all into that process too. Um, and and I, okay, Michael, that's great. Um, the other thing that I'm mindful of is that the one of one of our fellows at the Citizen Network has proposed that one of our challenges to engage people in this might be to copy the strategy of the Chartists. So back in the early 19th century, there was a big movement for these kind of radical democratic reforms that actually engaged a huge percentage of the of ordinary people. And um, I think that's one of the things that interests me as well. So I think actually working out how we can take some of our ideas and engage some kind of popular campaigning, some different kind of, they had a petition that I think 25% of the UK population as well signed up to, and it, it had some very simple demands in it. And although the, at the time those demands were rejected by the powerful, over the course of the next 40 years, most of those demands were actually met. So there are things we could do, that I think, to organise uh, that might be very helpful. At least those are the things that are on my mind. Michael, do you want to come back in? Just a quick word, uh, Simon. I'm, I know you all, most of you, and I think you know me. The only people I don't know have been Nigel Sollett and John Grogan. I haven't actually, I haven't seen John yet, but I've seen <laughs> Nigel. Um, look, can I suggest that we begin working together, all of us? Okay, that's all I can say. I, if as uh, as ICUK uh, coordinator, I would like to be in touch with Nigel and with John, uh, and send you our democracy paper and template. But can I suggest that we're gathered here together this evening, and we must work together, because if we do that, I think we can get somewhere. Bon courage. <laughs> nous tous. Thank you, Michael. Yes, and very suitable to get uh, some French in there, which is, fits very much the flavour of what we're trying to achieve, I think. Um, that's a good amount to end on, or not quite, Carol. Come in, Carol. It'd be great to hear from you. Yes, I don't know whether you've covered this. Um, I'm sorry I was late, but uh, I couldn't. It was technology, not me. Um, it's about grassroots action. We have a terrible culture in this country now. You vote every five years and let somebody else take your decisions. But lots of, uh, since COVID, there's lots of community groups that have started up. They're small groups, but they are coming up against this barrier. You suddenly found you can't do that. You have to get the council permission. You have to get this people's permission. And I think slowly they're realizing they can't do what they they think that what ought to be done. And I would like to see more uh, engagement with the, these groups. I'm not quite sure how we can reach out to them. I know certainly there's a lot of environmental groups. They would be interested in right to roam, things like that. They, they want to get more, more powers. And if uh, they may, may be really interested in a, a devolution model that we could offer to them. So is it possible to find out what's happening in Yorkshire? Yeah, I think that's a very good point, Carol. Interestingly, I mean, one of the things Citizen Network created it, um, with partners is the neighbourhood democracy movement. And that is exactly what that group is focused at, which, and Philip mentions this in the paper. I think you're right, that people's concerns are often feel very local and they don't necessarily aware that these connect to these bigger issues. And that's certainly something the neighbor democracy movement is trying to make people aware of. So that's one avenue. And through that, I certainly am in touch with quite a lot of other groups that are organizing around those ideas. So there are some alliances and they tend to not be talking about these issues. So there's a little bit of a gap at the moment between people thinking about constitutional reform and people thinking about local community power. But it's a gap I think we can bridge. I see Philip's got his hand up too. Philip, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to support what you said uh, just now, Sam. Uh, my history, work history, of course, is 
with uh, tenants and residents associations in Kirklees. And certainly when we spoke to them as individual groups, as Carol's um, suggesting, then we found that common themes emerged from those conversations. And it was those common themes that then affected the council's policies uh, and decision making. Um, just one example is that the year that the Tories decided to uh, put VAT on um, eating bills, they, of course, that became a major issue for um, the tenants and residents groups. And they all asked for cover to all insulation, or the start asking for cover to all insulation. And as a result of that, the council was the first one to introduce it to all insulation for all its then 20 odd thousand council houses. So it does work. I know it works on a small scale and with a local authority, but for me, it's about expanding those experiences across the whole of uh, Yorkshire. Thanks, Philip. Any other last calls before we call time? Just one question, Simon. You mentioned the Chartists there, and that, and, and I've, I've, you know, I have some familiarity. But I mean, is is there, you know, a simple paper that you have, or I can read, or you can tell yeah. us? Um, yeah, no, there is. In fact, there is, um, and yeah. So I'm going to put a link in here. Uh, actually, this is a little paper that um, Gavin Barker, who's part of the Citizen Network, he leads our constitutional reform work, did. It's called, uh, it's part of, uh, we have a project for this, which is, and it, he's co come up with End Westminster Rule, and there's some links in there to a little quick article about the Chartists. I found it fascinating, Ed, and I didn't know that history. I feel like I should have done. I suspect, like with a lot of things in the, uh, the curriculum that's managed for us by the powerful, that these issues are rather excluded from our learning, because this is about how change is actually created, you know, by people organising. So, yeah, I, I, I thoroughly recommend it because, in a sense, what you discover is that some of it's actually about taking some simplicity in our approach. No. I think that's what I learned. And I think it, you people will, if you find the right ways of describing, and I think that Philip's and Richard's document is, is a great place to start. But if we try to really distill this down into some language that most people can accept, and just you can go back and look at the chart the, what the Charter demanded, it's very comprehensible. It's the kind of thing that people could get. And I, I think that may be what our challenge is in the 21st century. Uh, let's, let's identify those key things. Let's work together. Let's mobilise people on the street by street. Um, because I think we won't persuade the powerful through rationality alone, will we? Yeah. <laughs> I think we have to distill the language up, Simon, not down, please. We have to find the Goldilocks area, which people understand. Not too complicated, not too simplistic. Well, I'm, I'm not going to get into that as we end the evening, what that, that means, Michael. There are different horses for courses, but I think if you look at what the chart has said, yeah, no. uh, no. it, it's something that most people, us common people, could get their heads around. And I think that should be one aspect of this i'm not saying it's the whole story at all um the the many most, many levels but the most important aspect yeah i agree <laughs> okay like on that note I, I can actually smell aromas coming from our kitchen and um, we've got guests arriving i'm going to go and uh, wish you all good night thank you such a a, a well-mannered courteous uh, respectful conversation well done to philip and richard for giving us this food for thought and I'd encourage as many people as possible to make it to Huddersfield on the 3rd of October uh, for the next step on this movement. Bye everyone. Thank you Simon. Thank you Simon. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure.